Thanks for praying for those churches, too. Thank you. And uh, again, appreciate prayers on uh, our son, who I don't think he's here, uh, Adam, surgery tomorrow. Uh, be praying for Ruth. She has surgery. Is Ruth here? Ruth's surgery this week. Keep praying for Russ and Ron Walker and all you sick people. Okay. <laughs> Keep praying. Thank you. Um, appreciate that for, for Adam tomorrow, too, and Ruth's surgery Tuesday. So, um, <clears throat> and if you ever read... Uh, any writers in the room, uh, take writing classes in college. They, um, there's a character types in writing article I read. And depending on the book or the articles you're reading, uh, I was searching for these two main characters you absolutely need in every story. Um, one article had 18 characters you need. Um, another one, th these two main ones. You always need a protagonist and an antagonist. Now, up until our story here in the Bible, we don't have any antagonist, correct? Everything is perfect. God looked out over the, uh, his creation, and it, it was all very good, very good. No antagonist. And how many people think that's kind of boring, especially if you're reading a story, right? You need an antagonist. Uh, today, is uh, four teams are left in the football the playoffs, and I don't hate any of the teams. So really, it's not going to be as exciting for me because there's, there's no one to hate. <clears throat> there's no Packers. There's no... Ah, kidding. <laughs> kidding. Kidding. Um, there's no I, I like all four teams. Um, you know, I'm friends with Tom Brady, so obviously I root for him uh, in that team. But um, uh, no team I had. I like all four teams, want them to win. So again, there's no tension then, and you need that tension. Well, today in our historical, true, factual uh, story, we get the antagonist finally. And uh, our characters, as we left them off, are in perfect bliss and harmony. Everything is perfect. Uh, this is uh, real life. This is what life is supposed to look like. This is what uh, life is uh, as Jesus promised it. There's God and there's man, there's woman, there's Eden, there's perfection and fellowship and harmony and unity and companionship. And we're missing that antagonist. Enter Satan. Enter Satan. And we finally get him. And uh, the enemy looks a lot like uh, us, to be honest with you. Um, now, we did this chapter, and I didn't realize it. Um, we did a spiritual warfare series that I don't even remember, so I don't expect you to remember. And that was back in 2007 when many of you weren't here. Uh, so we did the, the kind of temptation part. We also did, how many of you remember Christmas 2017? We did this chapter. How many remember? <laughs> Nobody. Uh, I, I asked for those who uh, give me input on the next series you want to study. Mary Randall said... Um, I forgot what book she did, Bell and the Dragon, I think. No, she didn't say that. I'm kidding. <laughs> kidding. Acts. And I said, Acts was the first series I did here back in 2004, 2005. Um, but I said, eh, you're the only one that asked, so let's do it. And we'll do a three-year study on it. <laughs> yeah. No, we'll see what the, what the Lord does here. But uh, we're, we're gonna, uh, what we're going to do, because we've done this chapter before in Spiritual Warfare and uh, the Christmas um, message uh, from verse 15, basically, uh, we're going to look at the whole chapter, right? We're looking at the Toledot of the heavens and earth. And the Toledot of the heavens and earth is actually chapter 2, verse 4, all the way through the end of chapter 4, Cain and Abel's story. So that's the whole thing. So you should look at it, that whole unit there. Uh, we're breaking it down in part 1, part 2, part 3. Today, part two being the fall, when sin um, entered the world. Uh, two things on the serpent, Ron read. Uh, there's a couple views on this. Some people think the whole thing is just mythology. It's uh, uh, symbolism. It didn't really happen. Uh, then there are those who think it really did happen, but then they say the serpent is actually not a real animal. It's just a title given to Satan. So I don't know where you land on that. Um, I think when the Bible says the serpent, here's what I do. I take it to be a serpent. I'm just dumb that way, though. And what helps me to take the view that it's not just a title of Satan, even though he is given that title even in Revelation, I take it to be Satan and an actual serpent. Uh, verse 14, uh, cursed are you above all livestock. Verse 1, he's comparing him to uh, other created animals. So I think it is Satan uh, speaking through the serpent here. I believe that. Um, so we'll just do that quickly. I think it's a real biological snake. I think this story is historical and actually happened. It is not myth, especially if you look at other myths. This, this story is actually kind of sober compared to other so-called myths. So I think it actually happened. New Testament supports that it happened as an historical story. So that's how I take it. So 
review quickly. Genesis 1 and 2, God looks at everything he created. Everything was right. Everything was good. Chapter 3 tells us why everything is wrong with the world, why there's so much damage and pain and conflict, why there's so much wrong with the world, with your life, with your heart, with your marriage. Sin enters the world here. If you read Romans 5, it doesn't look like sin was created here. It looks like it just entered the world here. But um, Okay, that's just the, the intro. I really believe that it's a biological snake that it, uh, Satan was using, speaking through the snake, and I think that uh, this story actually happened. Okay, we'll get through that, and then um, we're just going to go through the outline and look at the whole chapter instead of different sections. Okay? Are you all right? Everyone okay? You don't seem excited. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, let's talk football. Anybody hate teams that are out there? The Bears aren't in the playoffs. Get, who said that? Enerson? Out. Ushers, escort him out. All right, let's talk about Genesis. Okay, you don't seem excited, though. Are you excited? Talk about sin? Yeah, let's talk sin. Yeah, let's talk about hell. Okay. <laughs> you people are weird. Okay. All right. Uh, Ron read it. Let's start with the deceitfulness of sin. Uh, notice how Satan does this. He starts with conversation. Ron read this part. Starts with conversation. Did God really say? Uh, now, what we're going to do is apply. This is how the tempter comes at you, too. He starts with conversation. And notice that it's a religious conversation. Let's talk about God and his word. Very subtle here. Very uh, clever. Uh, my point is this. When Satan comes to Eve like this, he's not coming as some secularist. He's not coming as some atheist. He's not coming as some agnostic. Look at what he does here. Let's, let's talk about God. Let's open God's word and let's talk about what God said. You can see that he's just as this serpent, crafty servant. What is that? Am I okay? Okay. Uh, subtle and shifty and crafty. Let's talk about God. And the first thing he's going to do to Eve, and this is how he approaches us, he's going to try and obscure God's goodness. Think about that. He's trying to obscure, obscure the goodness of God. Did God really say any tree, subtle. Look at what he's doing to Eve here. Eve then says this, you must not touch. Uh, you, you can't eat from it, and you must not touch. Some people make a big deal out of that phrase in verse 3, that Eve actually added on. Some people think legalism here. God didn't say you can't touch it. Maybe she's just uh, uh, protecting herself. Uh, regardless of that, I think the key is to remember this. Did God really say that? Look at how he's approaching Eve. God really isn't good is what he's saying. Chapter 2, the whole point of chapter 2, this is what life looks like. And all the, in the context of that, it's all about abundance. It's lush. It's green. It's plenty. Every tree is yours, chapter 2, except one. Okay, that's how God approaches uh, the man and the woman. Every tree is yours except this one. Satan comes at it and says, did God really say, and you can't do this, focusing on the restriction? not the plenty in the context, okay? You following that? Uh, chapter two is flowing rivers, abundant food, uh, good-looking trees, great-tasting food, but the subtle attack, did God really say from any? Notice what he's doing here. He's not placing the emphasis on all the riches God permits, but instead on the one restriction God withheld. Now note that because that's how the tempter comes at you. The restriction is far more restrictive than God even said. Eve corrects him, but the, uh, the seed is sown. It's genius. Ron read that. Notice how Eve corrects him there, but I think the seed is sown. He's obscuring the goodness of God with the subtle attack. So note this, when the tempter comes at you, he is uh, going to come at you beginning with your view of God. How do you view God, what kind of God is God. Jesus answered this a lot in his sermons in the Gospels. What's your view of God? Careful, because this is how Satan's going to attack you. He's a Scrooge. He doesn't want you to have freedom. He's withholding something really good from you, some really good things from you. Uh, see, you want chocolate, and all he's offering is vanilla. Uh, you, you want a Lamborghini, he's only offering you a Toyota. I mean, think about that. That's how he's coming at you. Look at what Satan's doing here. It's genius to try and bring the fall. 
the key, the goal of this tempter is uh, to get you to become dis discontented with God. If you are discontented with God, how come he doesn't give me this? Where are you, God? How come you're not giving me this? If you're discontented with God, you're halfway to disobedience. So look at how the tempter comes at you. In fact, I would say you, you will never find a person discon discontent with God living in gratitude to him. It just will not happen. If you're satisfied with God, you're not going to be discontent with God. So your view of God is very important, and that's where Satan starts. How many of you memorized Jude 21? How many of you memorized the whole book of Jude? Nobody? Jude 21. Do you know that verse? Look at that verse. Uh, keep yourself, think about this. Oh, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Look, look at that command there. Keep yourself in the love of God. What, what is he saying? It's almost like the apostle here is saying, um, God loves you. In fact, he says that in verse 1 of Jude. God loves you. To all the people God loves. Then he says here, keep yourself in God's love. It, it's almost like he's saying it's your duty to realize God continually, continually realize God loves you. That's how you keep yourself in the love of God. Why? Because Satan's going to come at you. What, what's your view of God? How come he's withholding this? Where's this blessing? Why isn't he doing this? So your job, keep yourself in the love of God. Every single day, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me, God loves me. Mm. Uh, if you don't do that, keep yourself in the love of God, look, look what could happen. Keep yourself in the love of God. So the tempter starts with conversation, then he moves to contradiction. Ron read it already. You will not surely die. You see the uh, contradiction there? For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open. You'll be like God knowing good and evil. He starts with conversation, good conversation too. He's not a secular humanist. He's not atheist. But the contradiction, you will not surely die, contradiction, opposing, denying the word of God. He doesn't call God outright a liar, but he directly contradicts God on the penalty. Uh, this verse five, what do you, you notice in verse five, he's bringing in a rational explanation and a suggestive promise. Your eyes will be open. You'll be like God. So what is he saying to Eve here? Oh, Eve, I see you're taking God literally here. You're not going to die. God has reasons for his restrictions. You're, really, you're not going to really die. But, but understand why God did this. You're going to be like him. No mention of death. You're just going to be like him. God knows that if, uh, if he lets you have that, you know, that thing he's holding from you, uh, if he lets you have that freedom, you're going to be at his level. So here's God just, uh, he's just trying to keep you in your place. That's all he's trying to do. He's keeping you from maximizing your human potential. Uh, he's not so much a liar. He's, you know, insecure. He doesn't want you to be like him. You're missing out on so much fun. We get all these kids that come here on Wednesday, and uh, that, you could just hear Satan's lie to them. Do this, do this, do that. You're missing out on so much fun, so much fun. It's not so much what God says, but why God says it. He's trying to keep you down, keep you from having fun, keep you from your fullest potential. See, what Satan is doing here, and it's, again, genius, it's the understanding of God is more important than obedience to God. It's not about truth. It's about psychology. And this leap, leap he'll call it, it's really sin. This leap is really an act of freedom. So if you do this, you'll be free. You will be absolutely free. Throw off the shackles of God. Uh, virtue is not obedience, it's self-realization. Look at the real you that could come out. Careful, because uh, this is how Satan attacks you. This suggestive promise, your eyes will be open. Try to look, uh, what, it, what does he mean by that? Your eyes will be open. It's used a couple times. Uh, Genesis 21, Hagar is fleeing from Sarah, and uh, the, the, the same kind of term is used for her to, her eyes were open and she sees the well, she sees water. Second Kings, Elisha is talking to his servant, asking that his eyes be open to see all the angelic protectors there around. So, so here, Eve, your eyes will be open. What's going to happen if you do this? You're gonna have a burst of insight is going to come to you. You're going to, experience, you're going to experience something you have never experienced before. And that's true. But God calls it death. Huh. 
I really think this is true. If chapter two was the chapter all on what life, this is what life is, this is what life could be, this is the life that God wanted for you and for me, this is what abundant living is, that's chapter two. Abundance with God, fellowship, communion, intimacy, marital bliss. Chapter three, I think, and I contend that it's the death chapter. Some people think chapter five is. Chapter three is death. Uh, this is what dying looks like. More on that. Because they ate the fruit. They didn't die instantly. God must have lied, right? No, I think death came. And this is what death looks like. Chapter 3. Starts with converse, a conversation. It moves to contradiction. And then you could just see in verse 6, the beginning, Eve is just contemplating this. It ends with contemplation. She's considering it. I mean, the wheels are turning. She's ignoring the will of God. The, the very three things that she's doing in verse 6 is uh, the same things that John mentions in 1 John 2, 16, pleasing to the eye. Uh, she's, she's contemplating, looking it over. Hmm, it really does look good. God said this, but this looks good. Verse 5, I, I need to read this again because there's the definition of sin. Uh, point 2, I think it is, right in your bulletins. Definition of sin. Ian, do we have a slide for that? Wake up, Ian. Okay. <clears throat> definition of sin. Look at this. Um, what, Everything that God said is going to happen, happens. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. That's the key phrase. What is he talking about? Uh, the, the key, you will be like God. Knowing good and evil, though, what does that mean? Some people think they were kind of little robots. They did this, and now they know right from wrong. That is not true. I think they already knew the difference between right and wrong. I think they already knew the difference between, what's the actual words here, good and evil. Chapter 2, verse 16, there's a command given. God commands him, uh, you, are to, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Um, what does Satan mean here in verse 5? Uh, they already had to know right from wrong. So if they already, my contention is they already knew right from wrong, so what is he talking about this? The key to help you see what that is, is you will be like God. What he's saying there is, if you do this, you'll be in God's place. You're going to take over for God. Uh, the root is you, you, you desire, here's the root of all sin, you desire the place of God. Isaiah 14 is going to use this, and if you think it's about Lucifer's downfall, Lucifer's fall from heaven as he was created as an angel, um, in Isaiah 14, the same thing is mentioned. Regardless of what you think about Lucifer's fall, the same core and essence of sin is this. You want God's throne. And that's what he's talking about. Verse 22, he says it this way. Uh, here's the Lord speaking. The Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us. So it actually happened. The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. I contend he already knew what good and evil was, chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. So what's he talking about? He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. I think what he's talking about there is hell, but that's another thing. Um, so what is he talking about here? It doesn't mean that man, if he eats of this, he's going to be omniscient. I don't think he's talking about that either. He already knows right from wrong. It's not going to be omniscience. So what is he talking about? Here's what Dave thinks. Okay, you ready? Okay, ready. Okay, knowing uh, Acts, uh, Amos 3.2, uh, Jeremiah 1.5, uh, later on in Genesis, knowing is like choosing. So here's what I think he's talking about. If man eats the fruit, they will have God's place. Have God's place how? I will now choose. God doesn't tell me what to do, right or wrong. I will decide what's right and what's wrong. There, you become like God. I will choose what I determine to be right, and I will choose for my life what I determine to be wrong. I determine, I decide what's good or evil for me. Uh, so my sin is this, and this is the root of all sin, it's the definition of sin. I will become my own God, meaning I choose, I decide, I determine my path, not someone else, not... Elohim, not God Almighty. My, my uh, Northwestern University, yeah, it was Northwestern College back in the 80s. What year did I go to freshman? What year did I go to freshman college? I forgot. In Minnesota, but the guy was great. Uh, he said, here's his definition of sin, anti-God state of mind. That's exactly it. Anti-God state of mind. So think about this. Knowing right from wrong is simply meaning I want God's place. He's not God. I become God for my life. Okay, here's the problem. Uh, many of us think being a sinner is this. Loathsome, 
evil, wicked, disgusting, vile, vicious, violent, malicious, immoral, foul-mouthed, nasty, horrible. Don't think of being a sinner that way. Because when we think of a sinner that way, we think of, you know, them. (laughs) Think about being a sinner this way. In the context, what Satan is telling him you could have, it's yours if you do this, and that this is sinning and disobedience. Uh, you think of a vicious, vile, evil sinner this way. Uh, with your Bible in your hand, with God on your lips, with a smile on your face, you rule your own life. Because that's what Satan's saying here in verse 5. You decide your path. You put yourself in God's place. And that certainly did happen. And that's what sin is. Eve contemplates it. It says in verse 6 that Adam, who was there with her, just kind of, I think, just standing there, duh. (laughs) Typical husband, duh, right? (laughs) Um, They partake. They sin. It's called the fall. Sin enters the world through one man's sin, and this now becomes the death chapter because this is the descent of sin. This is what happened because they didn't want tasty fruit. They wanted to sit on the thrones of their life. And because of that, um, this is what death looks like. And the rest of the chapter talks about it. All that is lost in this chapter, uh, not only all that is lost, but all that begins as well. Here we got shame and hiding and mask wearing and denial and blame and rationalizing. Communion is lost between God and them, between man and wife. Uh, intimacy is lost. Truth is lost. Peace is lost in a profound way. Cosmic peace happens. Relational peace. That, not that, that, look what he says. That work isn't the curse after Adam is cursed, and we'll get into that a little bit. But work isn't the curse, but the hardship that comes because of work. Life is lost. They eventually lose physical life, but death is more. What's your definition of death? We think they don't die till 900 years later. Death is all over this chapter because they wanted to sit on the throne of their lives. Verse 24, home is lost. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Chapter 2, verse 15, I wrote in my Bible, he put the man in the Garden of Eden. We talked about that last week. He put the man in the Garden of Eden. How sad is this? He drove the man out. Home is lost. What is home? Because of sin now, we have this sense of not belonging. Not belonging enters the human race. Uh, Moses is writing to the, his generation of Israel, remember, and the ultimate cursing that's going to happen if you continue in your sin, the ultimate cursing after disease and enemies and slavery, the ultimate discipline is going to be getting kicked off the land. So the Israelite is going to look at this and say, they lost Eden. We could lose, according to the curses, we could lose our land. So what does it mean to die? In the passage, it's pretty clear in the context. It's to experience isolation, Separation, lack of truth, lack of harmony, alienation, including physical death. But we are dying a living death. I'm not here. <laughs> okay, okay. We're, we're dying a living death. So let's notice chapter 2, the, the chapter of living, of life. Chapter 3, death is happening all over the pages of this chapter. All over. Think about it. The wages of sin is this chapter. All the things with our sin, when we want to sit on the throne of God, it's all happening in chapter 3. It's a dark chapter, and Ron brought up darkness uh, and light here, uh, Satan being the angel of light, um, deceiving, so deceiving that he can make the darkness look like light. Um, I, I got to tell you, this chapter, as dark as it is, as bleak as it is, as much as death is involved in this chapter, uh, the key and most exciting part of the study has been the uh, God stepping in as light and destroying sin. I mean, after a thing like this, do you need any hope, any signs of hope? Well, they're all there in verses 8 through 24. With all the darkness, with all the death, it's all there. So if, if, if it's the, the wages of sin is death, is all over that chapter. What's the hymn, the line of the hymn? Uh, Grace greater than all our sin, taken from Romans 5, 20, where, where sin is, grace increases all the more. 
A lot of times we look at this dark chapter of death, we just see, oh, look at Adam's disgusting, Eve's disgusting, I'm disgusting. But look at what God's doing in this chapter. There's so much hope in this chapter. So I want to concentrate on just the last few minutes here. Go to the next one. Uh, All the good things that are uh, happening in this chapter. Uh, Grace is all over the place. Grace and God seeking. Um, Look, grace is just everywhere. This dark, ugly chapter with this message of Moses, here's what he's saying. There is hope. There is grace. And it's seen all over the place. Like I said, grace and God seeking. Look at verse 8 through 10. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day as they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called out to not Adam and Eve and not Eve, for your marriage problems, here you go. Um, he says to the man, where are you? Where are you? And he answered, I heard in the garden. God knew where he was, obviously. That here's grace and God seeking. Now think about this. Because of what Adam and Eve choose here, it's revolt. It's sheer rebellion. It's an uprising. It's a coup d'etat. And yet God is saying, where, where are you? I mean, you can hear it through a broken heart. Where, where are you? Why are you hiding? Why would he even care, God? Why would, he, why would he care for this creature? The fact that the omniscient God looks for, searches for, is seeking the sinners? What is that? Well, it's, it's grace. That's what it is. I have uh, two huskies, uh, any crack in the garage door, and they flee. For some strange reason, my dogs come back. But I'm at the point now where I don't freak out. I just say, see ya. It's been nice having ya. Uh, They do come back. I I don't go looking for them. I mean, who wouldn't want to live in my backyard, right? They leave and I say, see you later. Hope I have a lean to get you. No, they come back. Um, Look at what what Adam and Eve do. I love my dogs. What Adam and Eve do here, um, they're just a lot of work. God goes searching for them. I mean, immediately almost. What is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's grace. Grace and God seeking. Look at the next one. Grace and God's curse. Verse 15. I will put enmity. This is God speaking. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. I want you to see grace in that. When God talks to the serpent, he says, cursed are you. But when God talks to the man, uh, later on he says this, curse is the ground. Do you, do you hear that? I mean, do you even make note of that? Uh, cursed are you, serpent. Cursed are you, Satan. When he talks to the man, curse is the ground. Uh, not you, but curse of the ground because of you. What, what is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's grace. The serpent cursed throughout his life. Some people think uh, if it's a title, what he's saying here is, uh, look at the end of verse 14, you will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. They think that's a form of humiliation. There's some verses in Amos or something that kind of withholds that, but I think he's talking to an animal here, but he's putting this this humiliation on the serpent. Um, But the enmity in verse 15, God says, I will put it. I will put it. That's a holy hostility enters the universe. By who? By God. There is a holy hatred that happens now. And God puts it there. I mean, note this conflict here. The enmity comes from God. God put it there. God made the cosmic warfare. God started it. God implanted spiritual warfare in the universe. What he's saying is this, and it's all over grace here. It's all light in the darkness. God is saying, I will not let you have my creature without a fight. Keep yourself in the love of God. That's how much he loves you. I will not let you have them without a fight. There's holy war. What is that? I'll tell you what it is. It's grace. It's the stubbornness of God. You cannot have them, Satan, without a war. And the cosmic battle begins. Boy, it's grace. Note note the channel of salvation. Um, Notice how God says this. Don't miss this, please. God says um, this this channel of salvation is going to uh, come through who? He he says between your seed, talking to Satan, and hers. Who is the her he's talking about? Eve, right. Now notice that. Eve just sinned. Dopey Adam joins her. (laughs) Sin enters the world. How do you think Eve feels? Put yourself in Eve's shoes for a second. How do you think Eve feels? 
Uh, sin comes because Eve is deceived, the Apostle Paul tells us. Adam partakes, but this fight God announces is going to happen between the serpent and the woman. Think about that for a second. Ugh, that's it. We're not leaving until you think about this. <laughs> Your seed and the woman. How does he feel? He will crush your head, God says. It's a fatal crushing. You will strike his heel. But look at the irony on this. Who was it that the serpent deceived? Eve, the woman, who is the channel in which salvation is going to come. The serpent's demise is all hinging on the woman and her seed. How do you think Eve is starting to feel here? The serpent who deceived me is going to experience a fatal, fatal blow from my seed. The, the, the one in which Satan began his destruction, Eve, she's going to be the one in through which um, victory comes. Now, note that not, not only the channel, note the certainty in this. Ultimate victory is declared here. This is what we talked about Christmas last year. It's a fatal blow. Her seed, Eve, her seed wins. From the woman's family will come the one who crushes the serpent. How do you think Eve is starting to feel here? A little, little bit of hope? A little, little bit of light? A coming victorious man is coming. She, she thinks it's going to be one of her sons. That's how much hope they have. Even at the end of the chapter, verse 20, Adam named his wife Eve. That's all hope because they're believing God now. They're believing God. Ugh. Jesus came to destroy the enemy's work, to destroy the devil's work, 1 John 3, 8. Romans 16, 20, Paul says, the God of peace will crush Satan. But note that uh, what's Satan going to do back to her seed? He's going to strike his heel. Did you catch that? Note the costliness of this. this. The Savior is coming, and his blow is going to be fatal, but the blow back on him, it's going to be costly. It's going to hurt. It's, uh, it's going to cost him something. And you, you cannot tell me, if nothing else, the Israelites that are hearing Moses say this, they're going to start hearing, there's, there's someone else paying for our penalty? There's someone else saving us from our bondage. It's not about me doing it. You don't tell me they, they don't see hope in this verse 15 promise. My Old Testament professor in seminary said they, they couldn't have known that. The original hearers, no way. I'm like, crazy. They're, they're hearing there, there is light, there is hope, there is grace, there is a savior. That's why it said in verse 20, Adam names his wife life. Living. It's a chapter of death, but I'm hearing God and believing his promise that someone is going to save me. What is that? That's God's grace in the curse. Verse 16 to 18, let's read this one real quick. To the woman he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. Without pain, or with pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. We'll talk about more of that one next week. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife, instead of leading her, you listened and ate from the tree about which I commanded you. You must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and dust you will return. Now, I want you to hear something about this. Grace and God's restraint. The curses are bad. They're bad. It's not supposed to be life for us, though. Uh, you hate your job, get another job, right? It's not about living in the curse. Child, having a child hurts, get an epidural, right? Okay? <laughs> okay, I don't think we have to live like this, but here's, it, you need to hear the grace in God's restraint here. Um, uh, hear the grace here. Does God say you will never have kids? You're going to have kids. I want you to hear something of grace in this, that God is saying, here's my grace in the midst of your sin, in the midst of cursed, being cursed. You're still going to have kids to bring about the seed. I say that's God restraining himself in the punishment. And that's grace. Man, the ground is cursed. You're not cursed, but the ground is cursed. That's restraint. And I call that grace. 
uh, three times God says, I actually underlined it in my Bible, three times in 17, he says it again in 18, and God says it again in 19, these three little words, you will eat, you will eat, you will eat. What is that? It's grace. You're going to have hardship and toil. Life's going to be hard. There's going to be pain. There's a sweat of your brow, but I'm still going to provide. You will eat. What is that? It's, it's grace. It's hope. It's light. See, there's judgment on his creature for sure. But note also there's judgment in what he doesn't bring, meaning it could be a lot worse. Don't you think? Maybe you're facing a hard time, and a lot of times your, your prayers are, why, God, why? Why am I going through this? I think this is a good reminder that uh, instead of why, God, why, we could be saying, what, God, what? I mean, what, what are you not allowing me to go through? Oh, it could be so much worse. That's grace and God's restraint. Quickly, grace and God's provision. Uh, God covers the sinner. Let's read that real quick. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Notice he didn't say fur or sheep thing stuff. Um, garments of skin, I mean, he had, he had to kill the animal. I think that's the shed blood pointing to uh, atonement. Um, God covers the sinner's shame. Today, God covers the sinner's shame with the righteousness of Jesus. Uh, again, chapter two, and Jed, we're, we're done. Chapter two is life. We call it the toledot of the heavens and earth. It includes humans being made in man's image. It includes trees and food and provision and abundance and walking with God, but it also, in the heavens and the earth, it also includes death, the toledot about death, destruction and shame and sin. It gets worse, chapter four, where brother kills brother. There's murder in the universe now. There's sin and suffering and pain and conflict. Whole lot of messes. Uh, don't, don't think about the sinner who's so evil and wicked that you think about, think about yourself with your Bible in your hand and a smile on your face wanting to rule your own life. Uh, but what if there was grace? What if there was amazing grace? What if God loves you so much that when you sin and you break his heart and you make Satan smile, what if he looks for you and calls your name? provided a covering for you. He's providing a place for you. He continually, daily, seeks to have a relationship with you. So our job is that don't go out there, don't sin. No, our job is uh, keep yourself in his love. Realize fully every single day that the God of the universe loves you and forgives you.